Right, right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's win meeting. First meeting after quite a lengthy break over the summer and, of course, win conference. So the topic this afternoon is artificial intelligence. And we have all got this right. We've got Zesis Sawalas. Is that correct? I can't possibly read what you've got on your screen. <laughs> Who, who, who's going to talk to us about artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence obviously has the ability to remove a lot of drudgery from working life, but it also has inherent dangers uh, and, and the threat that she would actually get out of control and in the wrong hands and, and um, do humanity a lot, lot of harm. So Zisi is going to talk to us about this and also about what a Marxist approach to this might be. So do you want me to, you want to set a time, Zesis, and I'll tell you when you've got to. Do you know how long you'll speak for? Um, about 30 minutes. Is that all right with everybody? 30 minutes? Yeah, okay. I'll give you I'll give you a shout at 20 after 20 minutes. We just have to allow time for discussion, then time for you to come back in as well, because people obviously will be asking you a lot of questions, I think. So do you want to make a start? <laughs> yeah. Whenever. Okay. So, um, artificial intelligence, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Um, I think it's uh, quite an interesting topic and it's um, good that uh, at least a part of the left is talking about this. So, artificial intelligence is a topic that is now very much a part of the public debate uh, with the creation of tools such as OpenAI, ChatGPT or Google's Bard. And other tools such as Dali, such as uh, Dali, which can generate uh, an image from a verbal description given by the user. Um, artificial intelligence, however, has entered our lives for some time now in various forms. For example, uh, modern mobile phones, smartphones, um, which are now capable of taking very high quality photographs, have not only reached this level uh, so much by improving their sensors or their cameras. Uh, as by using artificial intelligence algorithm to improve the pictures uh, taken. Um, and since our lives will probably be heavily influenced uh, by, by AI in the coming years, uh, this discussion should be held not so much to provide clear answers uh, as to open up concerns. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what is AI? And the truth is that this question is kind of more difficult to answer than it might seem. Um, that is because there is no clear definition of what artificial intelligence is. There are several definitions. Uh, one of the, more the most uh, fanciful ones is that uh, artificial intelligence is the science that studies how to make my sins do what they do in movies. Um, but another definition that is by Patrick Winston is that artificial intelligence is the study of the computations that make perception, reasoning, and action possible. More descriptively, we could say that artificial intelligence is the study of how to make machines do things that humans usually do. That is, play complex games, recognize objects, structure speech and arguments, and make decisions. It is a branch of computer science that has been studied since the last century, actually. Um, so in the 20th century, there were two main schools of thought in relation to artificial intelligence. The dominant school at the time was indifferent to how the human brain works and believed that it would produce artificial intelligence through other techniques. The second school, which was in the minority for a lot of years, believed that the key to artificial intelligence lay in understanding the human brain and trying to simulate its functioning. This call invented the so-called artificial neural networks, which form the basis of all the great achievements in artificial intelligence today. Artificial neural networks have been studied since the 1940s after World War II, and the basic theory behind them was produced 30 to 40 years ago. However, they did not produce good results at the time. Um, what has changed in the 21st century and made artificial neural networks dominate is not so much the advances in theory, there were advances in theory, but the tremendous increase in computing power and the volume of data on which these networks were trained made them perform a lot better. It has therefore been observed 
that with much more data and with the computational power to process it, very good results can be produced with an artificial neural network. So how does an artificial neural network work? Uh, so it, it is a mathematical model that loosely simulates the human brain. It is therefore worth taking a look at how the human brain learns. So the brain, as you probably know, is made up of neurons that are connected to each other through, through synapses. As soon as a person starts to learn about the world around them, they adjust the synapses between the neurons in, the neurons in their brains, making some of them stronger, some weaker, and destroying some others. So therefore, knowledge is stored in the synapses of the human brain. An artificial neural network consists of artificial neurons um, connected to each other. So similar to a human neuron, the artificial neuron receives certain inputs to which it, it gives different weights, adds them together, and based on this weighted sum, produces an output. What does it mean to different, different weights? It means that it multiplies its input by a number called weight. And the training of a neuron is done as follows. It is given an input, then the output is produced, and then this output is used to calculate how much it deviates from the desired output we would like to have. Based on this deviation, this deviation is called error, the values of the weights are adjusted to better approximate the desired output. So as with synapses in the human brain, so with weights in the connections between artificial neurons, knowledge is stored on them. So the whole procedure is about adjusting the weights to get close to the desired output. So what an artificial neural network does is that it manages to discover correlations between the data given as input. Uh, these correlations are stored, as I said, in the connections between neurons and are called, and are called uh, futures and form what is called the future space. Um, as the complexity of an artificial neural network increases, so does the number of futures it can detect. When an artificial neural network has been proper, properly trained, it can identify the features of uh, the input it receives, and based on these features, it can generate the corresponding desired output. In addition, it has the ability to generalize, that is, to recognize not only the data on which it has been trained, but also new data that it has never seen before. For example, if, any, if a neural network is trained to recognize whether the animal in a photograph is a cat or a dog, and is given a photograph of a dog that it has never seen before, it will be able, it will still be able to recognize that this is a dog. And that is because it will be able to identify those features that make up the image of a dog. One category of artificial neural networks that was developed at Google in 2017 is the so-called transformers. I won't go into details about how they work, but this category includes GPT networks, which stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer, and of course, an application um, of GPT is ChatGPT, as we as you probably uh, know it. So, um, what what are the limits of AI? How how far can it go? Can it go? How smart can it be? Um, at the first glance, it's rational to assume that these great applications of artificial intelligence that have the ability to write poems, produce excellent and structured speech in an infinite number of languages, create photos and videos from verbal descriptions, and generally exhibit a seeming creativity and some kind of uh, imagination, um, uh, it's rational to say that they have raised several concerns about how smart artificial intelligence is and how far this intelligence can go. Again, there are two main approaches to this issue. One says that it is precisely because artificial neural networks 
are quite similar and based on the model of human neurons, that artificial intelligence can reach the level of human intelligence at some point. And it is mainly a matter of more complex architectures, computing power, and more data to train those networks. On the other hand, a number of scientists, including the scientist considered the father of AI, that is Jeffrey Hinton, believed that, there are not so, that they are not so similar to the human brain. Um, and this view is mainly based on the fact that the way artificial intelligence learns is quite different from the way human being learns. They might store knowledge in similar ways, but they learn differently. Firstly, because our brain learns with much fewer data. Um, we don't need to see thousands of uh, dogs to understand that something is a dog, for example. Um, and secondly, because our brain is an analog circuit, not a digital one. So the signal it carries are what are called noisy signals. That is, they not only carry useful information, but also noise. That is useless information that is transferred inside our brain back and forth. Moreover, um, the human brain can in no way hold the volume of data that an artificial neural network holds. But we are obviously smarter than AI, at least at the moment. So this probably indicates that the way we learn as humans is probably more efficient, more efficient and significantly different from the learning algorithm, algorithms used to train um, artificial neural networks. Uh, moreover, while uh, AI is good at retaining and synthesizing information, that is its main function, it is not very good at reasoning. It is essentially a machine that synthesizes huge loads of data in a stochastic, that is a random, statistically speaking, process. And that is where its apparent intelligence and creativity lies. Yet it remains some kind of a parrot that reproduces things it already knows without being able to synthesize new knowledge, since it cannot reason. In other, world, in other words, it cannot discover the causal mechanisms that produce the correlation it detects. For example, uh, let's suppose that we train the, an AI model um, with data showing that when you drop an object from above, it falls down. Um, so the, the network will indeed learn that when you drop an object, it falls down. So if it were asked, um, if I drop a rock, will it fall? It would answer yes, it will. But it will not be able to ask itself and, then, and therefore not be able to give an explanation to the questions, to the question, why do all objects fall down? So it will not be able to conceive a theory about gravity. Uh, these observations have led some prominent scientists to question the intelligence of these machines. In particular, Noam Chomsky, one of the greatest minds in the field of, in the field of linguistics, uh, along with two other scientists, wrote an article in the New York Times, which concluded with the phrase, given the immorality, pseudoscience, and linguistic incompetence of these systems, we can only laugh or cry at their popularity. Um, on the other hand, there are scientists like Jeffrey Hinton, again, who although they see the difference between human brains and artificial intelligence, believe that the risk of these machines outsmarting us is real, even if their own uh, intelligence is very different from ours. Of course, um, no matter how intelligent, intelligent or not these artifacts are, um, how, we, how close or, or far away from human intelligence they may be, they have a number of very important benefits and can help significantly many branches of the economy, the sciences, and even the arts. To begin with, researchers in various scientific fields, even in the humanitarian sciences nowadays, 
are already making use of machine learning tools, which in many cases are now essential to move the research forward. Um, the ability of AI to identify correlations between very large amounts of data uh, is now very often essential for drawing scientific, con scientific conclusions. Um, a very interesting example is uh, the AlphaFold tool, um, which has the ability to predict the shape of various proteins. And through this tool, scientists have been able to identify the structure of over 300,000 proteins um, up until recently unknown to us. Um, a discovery that, was rad that has radically changed research in biology, has helped scientists to accelerate research into understanding diseases, creating drugs, and even answering deeper questions such as the origins of life on Earth. But beyond research, AI can also bring significant benefits to workers. Primarily, what AI can eliminate uh, are the more routine and mechanistic aspects of work allowing workers to focus on the more creative, let's say, part of their job. Um, let's consider, for example, a lawyer who no longer has to manually refer to old laws and court decisions, but can use AI to produce a summary of similar cases to the one he or she is working on. Imagine an office worker who no longer needs to fill in Excel forms and write formal reports because AI can write it for them, uh, for him. Uh, artificial intelligence can be a very useful tool for accountants, programmers, uh, mathematicians, journalists, and even artists, if you think about it, because it can act as a source of inspiration or um, to, in order to create a basis from which to start a new project. Uh, in addition, there are many applications in, medicines, in medicine where doctors can be assisted by AI in both diagnosis and interventions. Also, in many tasks involving typical safety or quality checks, AI can be used to assist in identifying problems that may have been missed by humans. Um, and also, if we take into account developments in robotics, which are quite interesting also, uh, we can imagine a future in which a range of dangerous and unhealthy tasks can be performed by robots using artificial intelligence thus not risking uh, human lives. Uh, but of course, <laughs> these are all hypothetical scenarios in an ideal world, because as much as objectively this technology could lead to a better future for workers, in practice, it is very likely to lead to increased unemployment, intensification of work, and the reduction in wages. Uh, up until now, the picture painted by ruling class analysts is contradictory. According to an OECD survey conducted in 2022 among workers and employers in the manufacturing and financial sectors of seven countries, uh, developed countries, uh, there were no concerns about a significant reduction in employment due to the use of AI at workspaces. This is because the use of AI is currently limited. Um, as it is in its early stages and companies are still experimenting with its implementation. Furthermore, um, it is because instead of layoffs, currently people are retiring while at the same time companies are limiting recruitment. From this, it can be concluded that the expansion of the use of AI at workspaces is likely to lead to layoffs in the future. This is implicitly confirmed by the survey, which finds that three out of five workers fear they might lose their jobs in the next decade, which makes sense as jobs that are automated and then for car could be replaced uh, by AI in the future are estimated at 27% of total employment. On the other hand, the survey identifies the benefits of AI per se. Uh, as 63% of workers said that their work became more enjoyable with its use. On the flip side, a 2023 Goldman Sachs study identifies that while the use of AI could boost global GDP by up to 7% over a decade, 300 million jobs in developed countries are at risk. It is also estimated that such GPT applications alone will affect two out of 10 workers in 50% of their work content. 
It is estimated that around 86%, 86 occupations are exposed and 15 fully exposed to ChatGPT applications. I'm talking about ChatGPT only, not uh, AI in general. Among these exposed professions are mathematicians, physicists, financial analysts, accountants, journalists, lawyers, secretaries and administrative assistants, proofreaders, interpreters, translators, etc. However, in professions requiring human psychospiritual presence, such as teachers, lawyers, managers, artists, and so on, the impact will be limited or even non-existent. This is you've been speaking for 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll try to... For the next 10 minutes, yeah, then we've got lots of time to ask you questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, at present, uh, manual occupations do not appear to be threatened, but it is not unlikely that uh, developments in robotics in the coming years will be such that in conjunction with artificial intelligence, manual workers could be uh, replaced. Apart from the increase in unemployment, which is in itself a very negative phenomenon, the consequence the consequence uh, will also be a reduction in wages because historically the armies of the unemployed, as Mark said, have been used by employers as a lever uh, to lower wages. So, um, unfortunately, the negative consequences uh, of the use of AI are not only limited to the future of work, but also concern a number of ethical and, so and societal issues, uh, social issues. Um, the first and most important question that arises um, is that of personal data. If an artificial neural network has been trained with data from ordinary people, then what are the rights over this data and over this technology and its uses and the profits companies make off of it? Um, in addition, uh, artificial intelligence and, and specific systems such as ChatGPT can be used in a variety of ways for malicious use. Uh, they can be used to spread false information. They can be used to create fake images and even videos that seem to confirm fake news. Uh, they can thus be a very useful tool for far-right and systemic uh, propaganda. Uh, and apart from this information, uh, research, has, research has shown that uh, tools such as ChatGPT can be used for forgery, for copying signatures, for spreading malware, as a Europol investigation found, and even for finding information on how to make explosives at home from simple materials or how to buy illegal weapons online. Uh, and as the information on which AI systems like ChatGPT uh, is drawn from the internet and from the conversation Uh, from the conversations it has with various users, it can end up reproducing misogynistic, racist, homophobic speech, and it can even do so with solid arguments and the seeming objectivity. Um, that, that This has been uh, uh, proved by research uh, because while training GPT-4, research, uh, researchers found that this model could write very persuasive anti-abortion anti pro-racist stereotype, te stereotype texts, and so on. Of course, these uh, were adjusted and the final product does not produce such speech. Such speech. However, there can, there can be no confidence or certainty that this will not happen in the future. Um, and the data on which AI is trained influences the answers it will give to users' queries. Consequently, the selection of this data should be adjusted so that the model does not reproduce false information or racist or fascist discourse. So the question actually comes down to who decides what is false information and what is not. Can we trust a private company to do this? Can we trust a capitalist government to do this? Well, the answer in both cases is no, because all we will achieve is a special kind of censorship. A typical example is Elon Musk's statement that the artificial intelligence his own company will develop will be unaffected by the so-called leftist propaganda. And we can only imagine what this means and what these AI answers will be. Um, 
Also AI has been shown, uh, has shown uh, an unpredict unpredictable behavior. That, be that is because it is not completely understood what's going on inside uh, AI models and how exactly they calculate the answers they give. This is admitted by many scientists and even by the CEO of Google and requires a lot of care and a lot of research when designing, development and testing before releasing such systems to the public. Um, and unfortunately, the competition between companies to be the first to achieve the biggest leap in AI and therefore the first to make the biggest profits leads them to overlook critical stages of testing and tuning the models they build. Um, another very highly, another highly dangerous use uh, of AI is that uh, in the war industry. Uh, it is a fact that all the major imperialist powers wish to exploit this new technology for war purposes. Uh, this may have to do either with the development of robot soldiers or drones, for example, who can be deployed on the battlefield, or with hybrid warfare techniques, such as, for example, cyber attacks between states. This issue is also linked to another issue that is of great concern to many people, and that has to do with whether an artificial intelligence can somehow become sentient and turn against humanity. Um, it is very difficult to answer this question now, and probably impossible at the moment. However, we can say quite definitely at this stage with the current developments in technology, that AI is not capable of doing so because it does not have a will of its own. On the other hand, a military application such as a robot soldier should be able to make some decisions uh, in a way. Uh, that is, for example, if its command is to destroy a target, it should be able to determine certain sub-commands for itself through which it can achieve the goal in various ways. This ability can make this robot or drone very dangerous because it could kill um, a random person, for example, because it, it, it thinks it stands in its way of destroying a target. Um, so to kind of to, to sum up, because uh, I've skipped some parts because I don't have enough time, um, I think that we need to have a, a balanced approach on this uh, on this issue. And neither should we, should we fall into the trap of positivism, overlooking the negative consequences, nor should we resort to technophobic conclusions and some sort of modern ludism uh, to go out and destroy uh, AI and all the new technologies. Uh, AI can bring many benefits to humanity as can almost any major uh, technological development. But to do so, it needs proper and controlled use. And this is something that cannot be guaranteed by its own and cannot be guaranteed by the capitalist system. This is why social movements, movements must be vigilant and must immediately demand a series of measures that can impede some of the worst aspects of AI. Firstly, there must be a demand that it is not used in the war industry. We must also fight to develop a strong legal framework that will place restrictions on the development of artificial intelligence and protect the personal data of citizens. We should fight against the dissemination of false information produced by AI. We must demand that technological giants share their research, the code of the programs they create, and the data they use to train AI models with independent bodies, with universities, with independent researchers, so that unpredictable behavior, forced training um, of these models, the possibility of their malicious use, etc., can be detected more fully and objectively. Moreover, we should fight to defend jobs and labor rights so that the increase in labor productivity that AI will bring will be reaped by workers through a reduction in working hours and in increasing wages, and not by massive layoffs. Uh, these are, of course, a series of immediate demands that cannot provide uh, a complete solution to the problem. As long as the profit-based capitalist system survives and puts profit above human life and the well-being of society, states, governments, and companies will find ways to exploit artificial intelligence without regard, without regard to the risks 
and consequences um, as they have done in the past with other uh, technological revolutions. Therefore, the ultimate goal of the movement should be the nationalization under conditions of workers' control and management of technological giants, because this is the only way that the above can be put into practice. And only in this way will the development of AI be done in a way that serves society. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Zesis. That was really, really interesting. And bank on the 30 minutes as well. well done. <laughs> Before we just go into the discussion, I've had a request from Maddie that we have a, a short discussion about the Palestine-Israeli session, uh, situation at the end of the meeting. So I think to do that, I'm going to have to ask comrades if they could be fairly concise in their comments and also whether we may, whether OK, if we just run on a little bit. It just depends how the time goes, really. So is that is that OK with everybody? Uh, Maddie, I mean, as you've made the request, I'm hoping you're going to kick this off. <laughs> Right. OK, so can I uh, can I see hands up for anybody that wants to contribute to this discussion? Matthew. Pam, can I speak? Kieran. Yeah. Oh, sorry, did you have it? Uh, right, I think I thought, right, I think Kieran needs to hand up before. So can Kieran go first, Matthew, then I'll bring you in. Yes, so, I'm, I'm okay. not on camera. Yeah, thank you, Pam. I'm, I'm, okay. I'll be brief. I'm not on camera as I'm travelling, as okay. I always do at four o'clock on a, on a Sunday, unfortunately. Uh, it's it's very good lead off. Uh, you know, I appreciate the time and the effort that's gone into the lead off. I've I've learned from it. Uh, I didn't actually know that artificial intelligence was seeking to mimic human neural networks. I didn't know that. I could have found it out, but I didn't. Uh, it's exactly the approach we need. It, it's the approach of Engels. You know, we examine the science, we examine the data, we think about it dispassionately because science and technology are not political in the direct sense. It's a question of control. And I think that the left, broadly speaking, has made mistakes over the last 50 years with regards to its attitude to new technology. And it's the point you made at the end that, that we, you know, the left appears to be, you know, like Luddites wanting to hold back progress. And that has occurred on three occasions I can think of. Uh, the first being with the question of nuclear power in the 50s and 60s and 70s, when comrades on the left raised legitimate points about the nuclear power industry being developed deliberately by the nuclear powers, the military industrial complex, in order to facilitate the development of nuclear weapons. That was true. Uh, and also about the, the impact on the environment. Uh, how do we dispose of nuclear waste? But those questions became distorted, uh, and many on the left in the 70s and the 80s thought and argued that it was a socialist principle to be against nuclear power, where it never was and never should be. Uh, so, for example, if there'd been a socialist revolution in the 1970s, uh, and the only way to electrify the continent of Africa rapidly in a 10-year period was the creation of a network of nuclear power stations across Africa. Under socialism, we, we, we would have, of course, we'd have moved in that direction to lift an entire continent out of poverty. You know, like, like as in Russia in the 1920s, Soviets plus electrification equals socialism. Obviously that was distorted, but can we understand what I mean? It's not the question of the technology. Technology can never be wrong. It's a question of control. Uh, similarly with uh, uh Genetic engineering of food. I think the reaction of the left was it was a, re -jerk re a knee jerk reaction in the main. Uh, the genetic engineering of food by humans has been a fact since the dawn of the agricultural revolution. That, that, that's what the agricultural revolution was when humankind harnessed nature uh, and deliberately created genetic changes uh, over a period of years and decades. Genetic manipulation in the 1990s well, was different, of course. Uh, and of course, we, had to, we have to be careful. We don't necessarily say yes to everything, but it's a question of control, not the technology. And the other example, uh, but I think there was less resistance, was the question of the human genome, the human genome project, where there were two competing groups, one in America, which is entirely driven by the profit motive, one in England and Oxford, driven by altruism, uh, ca capitalist altruism. Uh, and of course, we favor the latter over the former. 
uh, but it wasn't sufficient in itself. You know, altruism is, is, is not what we're in favour of. We're in favour of genuine workers' control. So every technology is about control. You, you've outlined that. So that's a theoretical point. But the other point I want to make very briefly, it, it is it's very important that we get this right and that our propaganda on the left acknowledges developments under capitalism and in a way celebrates developments under capitalism because a lot of the propaganda of the left with its implication that we're in the end stage of capitalism, late capitalism, capitalism cannot deliver. It's true, but it's not true. And it's not true in the sense that capitalism, every day there are new scientific advances, every day new advances that you know are for the benefit of humankind. We have to acknowledge that rather than seem to be in denial about that. And if we acknowledge that, and we point out that these advances currently, they're limited because of the profit motive. It's all about profit. But in the future, under socialism, artificial intelligence, if there was a socialist world now, in 2023, and artificial intelligence was being developed, we can all think about the limitless possibilities. But there are not limitless possibilities because we live under the system of capitalism. But if we go to work in people and we seem to diminish or if we're negative about technological advancement, then we we don't get an audience. And I think too many on the left do that too. So, But, but I think your, your lead off, the balance was perfect. Uh, you should go into writing. Maybe you've written an article already in, in Greek, but it should be in English so it can reach a wider audience. But thank you very much. Thanks, Kieran. Matthew. Hey, guys. Um, I uh, also congratulate the speaker on the... Uh, <clears throat> that the instructions are very good. I think um, there, there are a few things. That, you know, someone highlights the, um, uh, the the attempt to mirror the human um, processing and processor, if you like, the brain. Um, you know, and and the fact that, of course, it's completely different to to a, to a digital processor. Of course, they. Uh, you know, the brain actually, of course, is is great at relating, you know, huge numbers of of, of data points to each other, um, you know, and and actually spends its time um, skipping stuff out. I mean, things like you know, functions like sight and hearing, actually, a lot of the data is skipped. It's actually, you know, then then infills, um, you know, so sight. A lot of sight is is, is a, a selective use of data, whereas of course with digital, you could process a lot. Uh, with a big enough processor, so it becomes a complete, complete different. The thing is also, you see, that the other thing, the other thing about about um, in terms of a, a AI uh, and 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 of course just general processing, of course, is control. I mean, it's you know, if you're saying, okay, uh, I I can you know, if I'm a capitalist and I'm dealing with the whole load of either my either workers or customers or whatever else, you can. Uh, use AI to predict behavior um, and therefore to control either customers or workers. Um, you know, so that, that you can do in terms of if you have enough data, you can then say, okay, well, th th this group of people will do, will act in this way and this group of people will, will act in that way. And you can section the whole thing up and you can then divide things up and say, okay, well, I will offer something completely different to one group as to another group. And that you know, therefore, you can use that use that as a as a, as a mechanism of control, and the mechanism obviously to to prolong uh, and increase the interests of, of of those in control who control the thing, you know, in, you know, in terms of, of capitalism, um, you know. So I mean, you know, for instance, I, you know, and, and it's very interesting. You can throw in all this other lots and lots of data. It's not just stuff in in relation to say. You know something directly in relation to, to the thing. You know even sort of things like you know people's pet ownership or you know where they shop or, or or any of this sort of stuff. If you throw that across, you know the data you've also got from from say a customer. Um, you know you can work out what what they're actually likely to do in a given situation. Um, it's it's it, it's extraordinary, but it does does allow you know this sort of this sort of degree of control. And the question is, you know, then how does you know how how do we get away from that? How do we how do we prevent that 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 sort of thing from happening? And the fact that obviously it means it it, it acts against the interests of the group being controlled. Um, the other thing, of course, and worse, of course, is 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 political control because it's useful for that too. I mean, this is this is the importance 
of the whole question of, say, the election of Trump in 2016, uh, or, or indeed, if people remember, the whole scandal about Cambridge Analytica in this country, which is where most of that processing was done. And the thing is, what happened, of course, on the basis of this, was that you know the big social media providers, particularly Facebook, were, were allowed to sell vast amounts of data so that, that can then be used for political control purposes. And you can pick out and say, OK, well, this lot of people are going to behave in this way in political politics. We're going to vote that way. Or I can ask them to do this and, I, and, and, and they'll likely do it. Um, you know, and, and, and that also, of course, is, is another, another issue. And that, that, of course, is going to get ever more um, important in those terms. The final point, of course, is when you, the, the comrade talks about military. Now, this is already happening. I mean, the Google Alphabet has Boston, the Boston Dynamics uh, subsidiary, which is dedicated to killing people. You know, the use of the use of, of computer power and autonomous um, uh, machines to kill people, uh, and the, the issue that they you know they've got that of course um, machines are much better at killing people than people are. You know, I mean, the, even drone operators get PTSD, as a machine doesn't, um, and so that, that that is actually happening now. That's actually out there, uh, and the question is, how do we get it? Top, thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Finn. Thanks, comrades. I thought it was an excellent uh, opening contribution. And I was particularly uh, interested in the final part and the conclusions about the nature of capitalism and the way in which we deal with these questions. Uh, the first point I want to make is that all these tremendous advances in human culture and scientific knowledge are all achieved by workers, not by companies, not by capitalism in the abstract, but by experienced, trained and skilled humans, workers. And when we talk about um, these developments, we're talking about the skills of engineers, chemists, technologists, mathematicians, computer scientists, etc., all devoting their skills to the development of the applications of knowledge the problem is that when these discoveries and these developments are achieved, the product belongs to the capitalist company. The same thing applies to the social media. All of us here spend a lot of our time giving out about the influence of right-wing social media. But the people who work and develop expertise in that industry are also workers. They don't own the companies. They turn up in the morning and work throughout the day, finish in the afternoon and get paid. Whatever developments or inventions are achieved in these companies, they're done by the workers, not by the shareholders, not by the owners, not by the chief executive officers. I mean, it always to stress that when we're talking about advances in human culture and science and technology, it's workers who achieve that. In this case, skilled scientific workers. There's also technical workers who work on the actual building of the devices. Now, there was a demand raised by the... I'm sorry, comrade, about your trying to pronounce your name. So, but I want to thank you for the various references you've made. But you call, for example, for the nationalisation of these um, big uh, tech companies, which of course I'd agree with. But that's a very complicated question now with the transnational aspect to these companies. So one part of the operation might be in Europe, another part in Asia. China, for example, another part of Mexico, United States, Britain. So the operation and the development of expertise encompasses several countries. So to call for nationalization, even though it's a correct general demand, which country would do the nationalization? Which, of course, is an impossible question to answer. So I want to pose another question here. The, the workers in those industries have to combine as workers. The first thing is that we need to have a trade union structure and organization that goes across all of the companies across the globe so that workers, be they in Mexico or China or Europe or Ireland, where I come from, and lots of high tech companies are uh, investing in Ireland because of the profits that can be derived from the taxation system there. All of the workers in these companies have to be in a common trade union structure, not necessarily the same union. They don't all have to be members of Unite, for example. They can be members of the unions in their various countries, but they have to combine across the globe in a single union organization and develop demands for that specific industry, particularly what is to be done with developments. 
I'm not sure about the demand which uh, the comrade raised about restricting the military industry specifically, because the companies that produce arms like Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems, all the big uh, international companies, they are just like any other company. They're producing for profit and to put restrictions on the military use, I don't think could be achieved. Um, it's an important general demand to say that a lot of the stuff that has been developed for um, humanity is being turned to military use. But the same thing was true in World War I. When the world's leading chemists that were operating in Germany developed poisonous substances that they could use to kill. So the uh, uh, science, chemistry, and the technology of building weaponry and uh, launching uh, devices was all um, turned against humanity. So the, the idea of the inventiveness of human uh, workers being changed to achieve destructive objects objectives has always been the case going right back as I said to World War One. In fact there was a a document called the Fuldo Manifesto by some guy called Fulda was the one that wrote it. And I think there was over 90 leading scientists and intellectuals in Germany signed this Fuldo Manifesto in 1914. I think the war, maybe October, the war wasn't long in existence. I think the war when it started in September, I forget. But anyway, in early, uh, in, the, in the early period of the war, the Fulda Manifesto, bringing together 90 scientists and technologists and engineers and intellectuals of various kinds, declared their support for the German military actions in World War I. So there's a huge problem in terms of uh, pr propaganda that we need to face, face here. And to, we need to emphasize over and over again that the workers and the organized workers in particular have to come together and they make the decisions. So irrespective of what, as I say, the modern day equivalent of the Fuldo Manifesto group would be, it shouldn't be up to them. They can decide what they like. It should have no influence. The influence should be in the hands of the workers in the various industries who then decide whether or not to implement or to develop certain uh, skills and certain uh, abilities with a so once again, I want to thank the comrade for a very interesting opening contribution. We all have an awful lot of work to do, thinking through the implications of this. We need to develop a set of demands which can be understood and which are realistic. But I want to just conclude by getting back to the main point I was making. The number one demand now is that the workers in these industries, specified named industries, combine in a single organization that brings together the organized union structures in all the various countries so they can make decisions as to what their expertise is to be devoted to. And they are the people that do the work. They are the inventors, the scientists, the chemists, the engineers, the computer technologists, the mathematicians. They should control how their expertise is being used and it shouldn't be left to the capitalist owners of industry to make these decisions with, with, with what has been invented by working people. And they're working people like the rest of us, no more than the factory hand. Thanks, comrades. Thanks, Finn. Uh, John or Dominic? Yeah, Dominic, again, I'd like to join the chorus, chorus of thanks to the speaker for an excellent lead-off and a stimulating lead-off. It made me think of things, and the, the points I'm making are sort of few rough ideas or points that I'd like some clarification on. So I think I'd go back to Kieran's thing about nuclear power in Africa. I think what we've got to look at is we're talking about changing society and not just using the technology of the capitalists that's left behind, but looking at the innovations of workers. Because I can remember back in 1970, I worked in turbine generator uh, factory. I was a draftsman there. And we had a joint commit a joint office committee uh, of union reps from the various offices that were in, uh, in the company. And one of the things we embarked on that didn't really get very far, but it was, it was there for a few years, was working with Manchester University or a section of Manchester University that were looking about alternatives to steam power 
to drive turbines, or not even to drive turbines, but to replace turbines. And we were looking at wind power, wave power, and particularly wave power. And that's been one of the least invested in areas, as far as I see, by the capitalists are in power generation. I'm the most steady, the most constant that there is. The waves keep rolling. The wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, but the waves are rolling all the time. And the whole the whole thing was blocked. Not not our particular little project, but the whole thing was blocked about developing alternatives to uh, oil and uh, what they call coal and nuclear. You know, by capitalism, they had already invested in their their sources, and the profits were now rolling in, and they didn't want to see anything else taking over. Because they don't want to invest if they can get away with it. Their idea is to make money without actually having to invest, to just exploit. And then the thing came to me think about this whole question of AI. I'm trying to work out how that will impact on capitalism itself. Because I mean mine's a very crude understanding of Marxist theories, but the capitalists don't make profit out of dead labour, which is what you're talking about with machinery, you're talking about with AI and all these things. So what's going to happen? They'll make profits at the initial stages because they'll be the, the best ones will, or the most efficient ones or the most greedy ones, whatever it happens to be, will make initial profits by squashing out the competition and reaching, if you like, a monopoly type position. But the, the only way they can increase the profits is not by make, you know, making machines work harder. It's, it's labor that makes machines work harder. So what's the level, given, given the, project, the, the, the predictions of major unemployment, what's the predictions for workers? It's like, I think back to when I watched the telly and you watched in the 60s and 70s a program called Tomorrow World, Tomorrow's World. And we're all going to be working a 20-hour week and living in luxury. All the modernization that's taken place has gone in exactly the, the opposite as far as the working class is concerned. So I'm sort of, those who are more into sort of economics than I am, I think there's going to be a major crisis among capitalism because of AI. And I think that's something that we've also got to consider. And I think with Ben's point, at the moment, we're not in a position to do anything about it all in the sense of materially affecting outcomes. The point we've got to do is explain what the situation is, what capitalism is, use all this stuff as illustrations of the rottenness of the capitalist system and point out the need for the workers who produce the wealth in society to actually stand up and say, we're going to control that. And I think that's that's the way I would look at things. But it's a bit, as I say, it's a bit simplistic, but I think there's some ideas of hope about what, what impact AI is going to have on the capitalist system itself that would, I think, need to be looked at by somebody who's got more knowledge than I have. Thanks, Dominic. Maddie. You muted, Maddie. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to take issue with the idea of electrifying Africa through nuclear power. Africa has abundant sun, lots of wind, and lots of waves. All the requirements for the kind of electricity that is possible to do without destroying, risking destroying ourselves. And this, I think, is what we should do. Even South Africa, with its huge goal, coal mines and its current very dicey unreliable electricity supply is turning to renewable energy and if south africa can do it the rest of the continent should be able to do it it doesn't have to it, the elite that make the take the political decisions for the kind of electricity you use are not yet invested in 
uranium mines or in coal mines to a particular to a, an extent which is not possible to move. So I think that we have every opportunity to change to to create human friendly energy and electricity in South in Africa. Thank you. Thanks, Maddy. Anybody else at the moment? I just I just like to say something. I don't really know where the actually class this as artificial intelligence, but I I recently bought a car which has a feature on it called driver assist. For those that don't know, you have a little camera behind your uh, your uh, rear view mirror in the front windscreen, and what it does, it watches the road for you. And if you go over the speed limit, it dongs at you three times. And if you go over the, the white line, it buzzes at you. And if you don't stay exactly between two white lines, it makes another noise. So you probably realise this is very, very distracting. The annoying thing about it is it's on unless you turn it off. So you have to turn it off every single on off again every single time you start the car. So having Googled it and on the verge of taking this vehicle back to the where it came from, I hit on the idea of blocking the camera. So I've now got like a, a credit card type of thing pushed up in front of the camera so it can't see the road. But that's now produced another warning that the camera's obscured. <laughs> it, it does actually stop quite quickly. Now, I think this stuff is extremely dangerous because it's really, really distracting to be constantly dealing with this stuff all the time. So I, I don't intend to use it. But I, I just wonder what Zeese has thought about that, you know, whether he thinks it's safe or not. Because, you know, to me, it might be handy if you're learning to drive. But when you're driving, driving for 50 years, you've already learned to stay, <laughs> stay between two white lines. So to me, it's totally unnecessary so uh, i just thought to bring that up actually because it seemed to be related to the the topic is there anybody else or do you want to come back and pack back and make some comments that, oh hang on rogers roger go you're next you, you're muted roger um i was hesitating to come into the discussion because i really don't know a lot about it, <laughs> uh, but even if for some very simplistic points, maybe that I'm making, but I think uh, I think they do underline very clearly just um, uh, how redundant the capitalist system is, because what we're seeing surely is that the power of technology is bursting through the limits of uh, capitalist society and of the capitalist system. Um, I'm, I mean, it, it's bizarre, really, that with all these um, futuristic technological developments, that the main um, that the main uh, theme running through discussions on this is always, oh, does, is this going to be the ap apocalypse? Is it going to destroy humanity? Is it going to be, in other words, uh, the paradox is that what should be a source of pride and optimism. Uh, about the release of humanity from drudgery, uh, that it's become a, 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 a source of pessimism and fear. Um, the fear of, on the one hand, of mass unemployment, not only among manual workers, but among intellectual workers too, but really making human labour, uh, of course not redundant, but making human labour so much more infinitely productive than it would have been um, than it would have been without this technology that uh, that it almost creates a society where you know of leisure for the for the for the um, whole of uh, humanity but um the other and the other danger apart from the mass unemployment or one of them is of course based on the destructive and hostile motivation of the capitalists and that's why all these the fears about what it would mean for war, what it would mean for um, you know in enhanced techniques of for repression and of uh, exploitation uh, and and so on, um, and these science fiction kind of nightmares, these futuristic nightmares, are um, are based really not on um, a fear of the technology, but of a a, a realistic understanding and fear of uh, the destructive nature of capitalism itself. Because after all, the machines have no motivation. They have no interests. 
They have no ambitions. They have no will, apart from, of course, um, uh, what I should say is that they have no intrinsic will of their own. They only have the will and the motivation that is programmed into them by uh, by uh, capitalism. And therefore, the whole question is, and I think um, Comrade Zisis put it absolutely clearly, and uh, it was really an unanswerable uh, case that he made, that what could lead to um, a human paradise in the hands of capitalism would lead to hell and, in fact, the threat of the complete destruction of humanity itself. So really what this means is that um, the development of um, this super technology is uh, it really dooms the age of uh, capitalism. And I think that's the way that we have to pose it. OK, thanks, Roger. Trish. <laughs> <coughs> Hello, I'm sorry I was late today and I'm really sorry I missed your lead off there, Stuart I'm fairly sure it, by the sound of it, it would have been really helpful because I'm just like Roger, probably more than Roger, I know very little about this technology really, but my instincts around it are a few things. The first one is warfare. I think that's the most frightening aspect of it. And the, the idea that warfare would be on our streets with potentially AR models that would come and probably come straight into any um, march or protest. And I don't see marchers or protesters as a stand solid against a, a machine. I just think that everybody would disperse. So I think they could be used to really, you know, from a warfare point of view, right down to the warfare, uh, class warfare. I think it, that, that the AI would really control us physically, physically control us on the streets. The other thing that I wanted to say is that I feel that AI will just be allowed to replace us. And I, in many ways, I think that that um, the ruling class and the, you know, the people who own the means of production, they have to look after the workers to a degree. You know, they let workers die, but there's some level of keeping the workers going. Otherwise they couldn't survive, but they could do with a lot le less of us. If AI, if AI starts to replace, you know, things like diagnosis, less doctors needed, things like, you know, the machines that can make things, cataracts operations, I mean, right through to really technical stuff, research, stuff that we would need human intervention could be replaced. It's just less workers. There's less of us needed. And that makes me think less healthcare, less education, less food. So they're the two things. The other thing, and the more immediate one, is that I think AI might be fantastic in its um, ability and how incredible we've been to produce something so clever and we're probably a bit scared of it because we've all watched Doctor Who you know we're probably a little bit influenced by our childhood fears and you know th these things might make us more afraid than we need be but but essentially where I'm afraid and where I already see it happening is in social care in the community where people are being replaced by AI instead of for instance people living on their own with early signs of dementia, for instance, where their families are worried about them. They're, instead of buying in support workers to come in because the state doesn't provide, it's a bit cheaper for them. And it, their children are often living far away now. And it's a bit cheaper for them to arrange to get a mat by the bed or a mat at the front door or an alarm by the fridge. So if their mum doesn't open the fridge for three days, they can send an ambulance round. Um, if their mum doesn't get out of bed, they can be, oh, she's possibly had a stroke, we better send someone round. And, um, you know, this is already happening. And this for me isn't just about it being painfully inefficient, which it is, it's also painfully inhuman. And, um, and actually what we need as humans is social interaction. We're social creatures. We're not solo creatures. We're not tigers. We don't just meet shag and go, although that's very tempting. The truth is, by and large, we need relationships. You know, we're not herd creatures. We don't just run when everyone runs, although there's a bit of us that is a bit of a herd mentality. But we're social. Social hierarchy, social interaction is our mental health, really. It's how we, it's how we are programmed actually biologically so we need human interaction despite there being some people with neuro neurodivergence who might need it less or people who might choose because of mental ill health 
to be more solitary, generally speaking, we rely on each other for interaction. And if we don't have that, I think we'll become, as a, as a species, and I think we're already becoming quite mentally unwell. And I think that would also lead to um, an apathy that would stop us even fighting the capitalists with their machine-driven AI. I think we'd all end up at home with a bit of a black mirror, it's all on our phones, playing games, because I already do that a bit because of disillusionment. That's been my honest thought on it. Okay, thanks, Trish. Just before we go on, can I just ask Kieran if you can try and keep your phone on mute? It keeps on muting, and we're just in this sort of sound like a distorted bath emptying, and it's happening every few minutes. So I have muted a few few times. If you could just try and do something with it, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, are you waving, Jimmy, or do you want to speak? Well, that waving, waving might be way of getting your attention, Pam. However, okay. yeah, I, I do want to make a comment. First of all, I want to congratulate Mrs. This is an excellent, excellent contribution to the discussion. Um, and I really respect the way you presented it and the content of what you presented. I'd like to hear more speakers like that in the future. Um, one thing that I want to do, and I haven't praised one comrade, I want to exercise an unusual target for criticism, and that is Comrade John, or sorry, Comrade Dominic. Um, and it, it's just, I don't know whether it was a slip of the tongue, but uh, the comrades explained that he was planning, uh, I spent a number of years working to get steam out of technology, to get steam out of industry. One thing that I've done for the last 30 years is that I have been promoting, defending and using STEM to feed my family because it was what I did for a living. Um, but the, the reason is not sentimental or anything else. The reason that I'm defending STEM is that STEM as a medium is not an antiluvian um, material. It, it, well, it is an antiluvian material, correctly. But its usage is not limited, it's not historical, it's current. There are many, many, many industries right around the globe using steam as a medium for transmitting energy, whether it's for cooking processes, whether it's for movement of machines, whether it's for sterilization in small units. Steam is enormously important. It's clean. Steam is efficient. Steam is controllable. So steam is not the problem. Steam is good. Well, it has been the problem and has confused uh, people who are critical of the steam industries was the campaigns against what went up the chimney, the combustibles that went up and created problems in the atmosphere. The main fuels were the oils, the gases, the solid fuels, the peats, the timbers, the coal. All of them had byproducts which damaged the atmosphere. But they were not the steam. So... In the recent years, there has been a transformation in the steam industry in that we have seen the re-emergence of what are nothing other than big boilers, big electrical boilers. We have boilers coming in, uh, high power boilers with electric elements in them. There's nothing unusual. Simple technology is stick a couple of elements down the tube, put them inside a boiler and just shoot away. But the point about it is you then are faced with the problem of where does that electricity come from? And you're right back to the same circle. You've got to make your choice. Now, all the, the developments so far with wind, with wave, with solar, they all claim that they're supposed to be uh, far better than the previous materials, the, the fossil fuels, etc. And there's a certain truth to that. But it's not the full truth because all the machines that make or generate, all of them, using in their own manufacture in the extraction of the materials they don't come clean they come with baggage and that's something that we should watch that the, the, the field full of uh, wind generators the, the bay full of again the same generators or with wave uh, catchers these all cost money to reduce all cost materials to reduce now the question comes back to the exact same thing that we started with who controls, who makes the decisions. Now, sometimes the decisions, well, in nearly every case, the decisions, technical decisions, are made by a generation of engineers, by planners, uh, by designers, 
that there has been a change in the educational system internationally over the last generations, which has kind of built in a, a, a guilt complex on the one hand to designers designing machines using STEAM, but at the same time uh, are reflecting the pressures that are coming from the real owners, from the capitalists and the state bodies or whoever they are, whoever owns the plant, whoever owns the money, they are the real people. And that is the core of this issue, that despite the arguments that we might have about the efficiency, the benefits, or the choices of technology, at the end of the day, it's got to come back to who owns what and who owns the money. And that's where the political choices come in. And that's where, that's where the future arguments should be, not just on this industry, but on, on, on all topics. I'll just leave it at that. Thanks very much, Jimmy. That is that, of course, is a rail enthusiast talking. <laughs> <laughs> right, John or Dominic? <laughs> yeah, it's Dominic. I'm sorry, uh, Jim, if I came over, I was against steam steam generation. It's the method of heat, you know, heating up the water to get your steam. I was talking about, which is yeah. oil, gas, nuclear, all of them polluting the planet all of them endangering the survival of our species. I mean, obviously, all the other systems that talk about these nodding ducks that they used to talk about back in the 70s, as far as wave power is concerned, is going to heat your kettle up. Not bothered how. it was. There was no concern about actually generating power. The concern is about what you, you know, how you generate that power, what fuel you use, not about getting rid of uh, steam production. I mean, as you say, it's an aid to mankind in various sectors. But I was, but that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about the massive coal production for steam-driven turbines and the, the whole danger of, ste of steam-driven turbines generated by nuclear power. It's, it's, it's the source of energy that provides the, 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 you know, the production of the power not how uh, what what sort it is it's, it's how how dangerous it is to society if i've made that more confused i'm sorry okay thanks dominic i don't so, see so just with your permission pam i, I said dominic, you what, sorry I, I, I fully understood what dominic was saying i just wanted to bend the stick a little more just in <laughs> favor of the steam industry that's okay <laughs> right thanks very much <laughs> Don't see any other hands up at the moment. Just for anybody that joined the meeting late, we did decide at the beginning we were going to have a short discussion on the escalation in the um, Israel-Palestine situation. So I hope comrades don't mind if we just go over time a little bit to, uh, to fit it all in. Um, anybody else want to speak before I invite um, Thesis to come back and perhaps respond to some of the points? No? Right. Do you, want to, do you want to come back in, Cece? So also a lot of things have been raised, and I, I imagine you will you will struggle to cover them all. But if you'd like to come back in now, make some comments, that would be good. Yeah, I'll, I'll make some basic comments. Uh, I can't cover anything, as you said. <laughs> but I, I'll be brief, though. I'll be brief. Well, as I said in the beginning of my lead-off, this discussion should be held to open up concerns, and I think it did. Um, we've got a lot of discussions to make around this issue. Um, we've got uh, a lot of different uh, points and uh, ways to, 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 to approach this issue, and you've got, we've got to consider them all uh, in order to get to a, uh, to a solid uh, position on this matter. Um, some, some brief points. Um, it's actually quite uh, quite interesting to see how AI uh, is going to be used to control our lives, uh, to to stop us from uh, from organizing, to stop us from protesting, um, to, to basically uh, be um, a break in our uh, political activities. Um, and this is already happening, actually. Um, so uh, Amazon 
I don't know if you if you've heard of this, but uh, Amazon uses AI algorithms to predict um, in which warehouses there may be trade union uh, activities. And they try to predict these activities before they happen, before the workers there uh, organize themselves and uh, are actually taking measures to stop them from unionizing. Um, that's that's a thing. That's a thing. And I, I think that the also the state and other companies will use these sort of techniques in the future. And... Uh, to answer the question, how do we escape control through AI is not a thing that can be answered um, easily. Uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, in the end, it comes down to overthrowing capitalism. <laughs> but um, what we can say right now, what would be a, an immediate measure we could take, what would be... Um, let's say our initial point is that we must uh, fight, uh, we must try to organize to uh, trade unions in large, uh, in big tech uh, companies. That's, I think that's the main point we have to keep. The left has to fight in order to organize workers in big tech companies. Because if workers in those companies go on strike, um, protesting about how uh, their company developed uh, AI tools and how it's using them, then that is a very strong weapon to use to stop this company from developing and using AI in that manner. Uh, so the, the basic thing is we need trade unions. We need workers to protest, to go on strike and demand uh, at least not, not completely controlling a, a company, but uh, uh, having a say in how uh, advances in technology uh, are used and uh, are being developed. Um, and we, what we, we must also fight for uh, is... Uh, legislature um, that uh, prohibits companies from um, uh, using our data and using AI algorithms to uh, control uh, citizens. And that mainly uh, has to do with the collection of data. So we must fight so that it is illegal for Amazon or for Google or Facebook to track our activity on their platform and use that to train AI. Um, that is not easy. And there's no guarantee that if such a law is uh, voted for, that then it will be actually uh, applied and the companies will, will respect that. So that also needs uh, workers to be vigilant and uh, um, demand that this sort of uh, legislature uh, is actually applied. But uh, it's important to demand that. There is uh, some sort of legislature being uh, prepared in the European Union about AI, but uh, there are a lot of, um, it provides a lot of, ex uh, it provides for a, a lot of exceptions when it comes to matters of national security. So for example, uh, us being tracked by a street camera and uh, using um, AI to recognize our identities uh, would be allowed by such a law. So it basically does not protect uh, the citizens. Uh, um, the final uh, point that I would like to raise is about whether or not uh, technology is political. Um, it's a difficult question to answer, but I, I, I'd like to say a few words about it. I think that technology on its own, in a way, it's not political. Okay, um, a machine is a machine under capitalism, under socialism, under any sort of uh, system. Um, it's The control of technology is the most important aspect. But those who control technology also control its development. And its development is affected 
by how profitable uh, one or the other, um, let's say, way to go is. So, um, for example, AI right now is developed in a very empirical way. So what uh, most uh, researchers do is they take a very good model, they make some adjustments, they try it out and they see if it's uh, working better or not, if the results produced are better or not. But um, there is no concrete theory behind how those models work. There, there's no any sort of equation or mathematical model that can actually explain and predict how an AI model will respond and how um, and how it works, how exactly it works. There are black boxes, things that we don't understand about current AI models. That is very dangerous on its own. Um, and under capitalism, there's no way this is going to stop. Under socialism, we would never use a technology that we that we do not understand. Even though we can see that it's helpful, we would not use it if we would if we weren't able to understand the theory behind it. That's completely undialectical. A dialectical approach means that I um, I see something, okay, and I'm trying to produce a theory to explain it, and then I'm testing this theory and see. If it um, if it proves um, the thing I'm seeing in in the real world, um, that should be the right approach in in technology and sciences, and that's not being done right now because that is not profitable for the capitalists, but that also may hasten the progress of technology, because if we had a theory about AI, then we may and, and by understanding it better, then we may have been able to produce even better machines, even stronger and smarter machines, even stronger AI models. So that is a point I'd like to make. Um, I think it was a great discussion and uh, I'd really like to have uh, another discussion as soon as possible. Right, thanks, Cece. I think that was really, really, really excellent lead off. Really good summing up, and um, you know, everybody's made some really relevant point. I'm sort of going to guess nobody wants to make any last minute points, only because we've been asked to have this <coughs> discussion on the Israel Palestine situation. I don't see anybody indicating otherwise. Right. Okay. So yeah, so I think I think we we finished the discussion there. Hopefully we will we will get back to it. And again, big thanks for Cesis for leading off and for everybody's discussion. Hope you will come to some more wind meetings, uh, Cesis, in the future. We're really good to see you, <laughs> a young person. <laughs> Hang on to him. <laughs> right. Okay. So I'm going to move on now. Um, Maddie, there's Maddie. Matt is good. We're only going to have a short discussion about 30 minutes on the Israel Palestine situation. We don't have time to have a full discussion this week. So, for about 30 minutes, I'm going to ask Maddie now to come in and, and kick it off. You're on mute, Maddie. I should thank you, Pam. And thank you for a very interesting discussion on AI. Um, and then lots of questions for another day. Uh, yesterday, I stopped watching CNN and BBC. I moved all my watching to Al Jazeera. I started the morning watching BBC and CNN and they talked about this invasion of Israel as though Israel had done nothing previously to deserve it isn't the right word, but to prepare the ground for some for a retaliation, perhaps is more as far as I can see, um, this is a tit for tat thing. The there was a huge Israeli attack on pa the Palestinian people on the last day of Ramadan, 
I don't know how many people remember that. And there was a certain amount of consternation because in the world, probably more on Al Jazeera than anywhere else that's available to me anyway, about um, disturbing one of the holiest times of the year for followers of Islam. So what is what does Hamas do? They attack Israel on the last day of the two week or so period of celebrating New Year, fasting, and then celebrating the festival of the harvest. In other words, both attack on an important religious holiday. They attack in the morning without warning. What is, I find amazing, is that there was absolutely no indication beforehand that this might happen. And it is quite clear that the Israeli um, security and military were totally, une totally unexpected. What's also surprising to me is that the Palestinians have been, at least until I switched off my um, TV in the early afternoon, um, they've been able to maintain their attack. And the last figures I saw were 313 Palestinians dead. This was given by Israel. And over uh, 600, in other words, virtually double the number of Israelis killed. Both sides of between two and 3,000 wounded. Um, and... People have, I've seen some really horrible um, propaganda someone sent me. Uh, I'd just like to read a couple of lines because I think this is something that has penetrated the Western media. And the reason I want to take this whole thing up is because I think we must prepare ourselves, we must guard ourselves. And I'd really like be so happy if we found a way of dealing with this in a comradely fashion together. So I quote, Our country was attacked by a cruel enemy who murdered children, women and men in cold blood in their beds. They took captive babies, mothers and older people. On the eve of a holiday, they are proud that they have attacked prosperous and peace-loving villages of farmers and looted their homes. They massacred children who were celebrating at a nature party and calling their crimes a victory. And so it goes on. Who do you think wrote that? Israel. Who do you think might have been able to write it with almost the exact wording? Hamas. This is a, this is what has been happening to the Palestinian people for years, and I'm very depressed about it because I feel so totally and utterly helpless. And I do hope that some people can, in this group, can begin to start moving towards some way of providing a, a comradely response, a supportive response, and oh my goodness, wouldn't it be great if we could get them to talk, to sit at a table and talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Maddie. Um, I'm guessing one or two people might want to make a comment. You just put your hand up if you do. Matthew, well, I think we'll have to try and keep it to about three minutes if we can, Matthew. Right. Okay, there's a lot time. to say. I know I mean, there is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the thing, the point about this is, you know, Gaza is a concentration camp. It has 2.3 million people. 
and mostly youth actually contained in a in in a tiny area uh, no more than 12 miles long um and it has been treated appallingly i mean you you, you basically semi starved um you know denied fuel uh, clean water um building materials you name it uh in a you know say atrocious conditions um you know uh, by by the israelis and with the support obviously of the imperialists and of course you have this breakout from that terrible situation which must be supported um and and of course the response of the imperialists is to say well how do we intensify the oppression of the, of the concentration camp you know it's horrible um and the, the thing is, the question really is going to be, uh, what is the response, uh, you know, around the world in terms of support for the Palestinians? Because obviously, the the uh, program of the of the Netanyahu government is is a, is, a, is a, will be another mass attack. I mean, they're openly planning the expulsion or killing of, 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 of if they can if they can the, the entire population. You know that that is you know nakedly and, and clearly the the uh, the program of, a, of certainly a, a, a substantial chunk the fascist chunk of the of the uh, Netanyahu uh, government and this is going to wind up in a massive crisis in terms of you know the world and and and, and the Middle East and so on and the question will be the response of the masses to that um, you know it, it is of going to be extreme and and it's quite possible you're going to see. You know, a, a breakout of a much much wider war. Um, th this is you know entirely entirely impossible because of obviously the the degree of of sympathy for Palestinians in the area and 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 and, and more widely. And the question, you know, the, all of these questions will be will be up. The the, the the problem being, of course, obviously, you know, we can we've seen the 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 whole split. Of, of Israeli society in, in terms of the, the Jewish part of Israeli society around, around you know, for and against Netanyahu. However, it has not got to the point where it's questioned the occupation. I mean, this is the point, but this is the thing. I mean, there's been this old argument in terms of the left, you know, should, what should be the attitude to, the, to these massive demonstrations in Israel? I mean, some of us say, well, yeah, the, the, the question is obviously to, 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 to go and argue with those people, say, look, look you can't. You can't preserve anything. You, know, you can't have democracy with it, with it under conditions of an occupation where you know, half the population denied any rights, of, you know, or, or have minimal rights and whatever else. You can't have anything called democracy under those conditions. But obviously, that hasn't penetrated. Um, but I mean, this is this is really going to cause a, a, a very profound something. Very profound. And I, I say, I don't. I wouldn't be surprised if we, if we have a wider war as a result. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Uh, Peter. Hey, comrades. You know, we've got to put this into perspective here. The Palestinians be persecuted by the Zionist, uh, by Zionist apartheid Israel for 75 years now without stopping. I think there's something like two and a half billion Palestinians had to uh, leave that country and went to Syria. There's around about one million um, left for other countries, and countless thousands have been murdered, and that's the word I would use, murdered by the Zionist Jews. It's a shame, you know, because some of the best people in the world are Jews. They're just not Zionists. There's a big difference, a hell of a big difference. Netanyahu uh, is run by a Zionist, and I think the there's, there's several dangers here. Firstly, already as anticipated, the USA is behind the war. England is behind the war. Storm as a Zionist confirmed out of his own mouth. And that doesn't bode well for this country when you've got a leader who is a racist and a Zionist supporter of an apartheid and illegal Israel. Can I give you all a bit of advice? Tony Greenstein recently wrote a book it's called Zionism During the Holocaust. In that book, which is all from facts and documents available to this day, you will find a, a part of it dedicated to the collaboration of the Zionists with the uh, Nazis 
to send more Jews to the death. That's a matter of absolute fact. Otherwise, Tony wouldn't have printed it. But get yourself a copy and read the truth about what's been going on in Israel since 1948 and continues to the present time. Yes, the answer to it is always getting around the table. And I would love that to happen. But you know, you've seen Joe Biden. You've heard what he's got to say. You know Stormer. And where we are concerned and America's concerned, the rest of the world doesn't get a look in, unfortunately. Thank you. OK, thanks, Peter. I'm just going to take the remaining speakers that we've got, because uh, I think we do need a full discussion this at, at, at a future week. So um, uh, I'm going to take John and Dominic and then Finn. So John and Dominic, or John or Dominic, do you want to go well, first? Okay, it's both of us. Tom, could you add me to the speaker list, please? Karen. Yes, Karen. I'll, I'll bring you in a minute. Right, so John Thank and you, Dominic. John, it's fine. John and Dominic, one after the other. John, John first. Um, I'd just like to say that... It's been quite disturbing prior to Saturday's, if you like, breakout that uh, was achieved from Gaza. The fact is that it, on the news this week and on the BBC, there was actually an item that about summed up the attitude in Israel. And it was an, an item covering several issues. One was the fact that... Uh, a Christian pilgrim sort of um, procession through Jerusalem had been spat on by ultra-Orthodox Jews. And the other item was to do with the fact that ultra-Orthodox Jews had moved into a Palestinian part of West Jerusalem, saying that it was their national sort of celebration and that the Palestinian shops should shut up. And this was actually quite sympathetic, the item to the Palestinians and the facts of what was happening, you know, in Israel with regard to, if you like, ultra-Orthodox Jews. The position, as far as I see it, and the real, if you like, um, catalyst has come around through the settler population and the fact that we now have what can only be called as extreme right, if not fascist, elements within the Israeli government, Benny Gantz, etc., where these people are bringing in laws that will allow settlers to arm themselves American style, and also that there has been pogroms have gone on when... Palestinians have objected to what's happening in the Janine um, refugee camp in the West Bank, that there's been attacks on Palestinian households, businesses, etc., by well-organised and well-armed settlers. And I'm surprised up to now that we've not heard of some type of massacre in the West Bank by settlers of some of the Palestinian, you know, sort of areas. And as far as I'm concerned, both Joe Biden and Keir Starmer are living in some cloud cuckoo land by not recognising the very real danger of the recent developments in Israeli politics where Benjamin Netanyahu would uh, shake hands with the devil to keep in power. And there are people in the Israeli government now that are hell-bent on, if you like, a final solution to the Palestinian problem. I'll leave it at that, comrades. OK, John, Dominic. Yeah, I think, to my mind, when you look at the situation, as John described, there's been horrific actions by the Israeli government and their supporters, and there's been horrific actions by Hamas. I don't see a great deal of political difference, apart from the, the, their opposition to each other, of, of the rule of Hamas. I think we, we've got to take the view, quite honestly, and step back and look at the situation from a class position. And the, the, the real frightening thing to me is not what's going on in Israel. Well, it, it is frightening. But another frightening thing to me is the fact that the Labour leadership across Europe and America and anywhere else has not raised any voice 
about the need for the working class to unite against both of these people and both of these sides and fight for a class position to advance the interests of the Israeli people and the Palestinian people. And the only way to bring them together is, is by uniting the working class. That's the only solution I can see in that situation. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be bloodletting for, from now until whenever. Because I think, to my mind, it's it's not quite the same thing. But the Northern Ireland situation, a lot of the left jumped on the bandwagon of the IRA and the provisionals. And they, they never touch on the fact that they carried out ethnic cleansing just the same as the loyalist paramilitaries. I don't think we've got to pick sides in the sense of supporting Hamas because we're opposed to the colonization of Palestine by the Israelis. I think we've got to accept the colonization of, of, of Israel now. You can't sort of drive how, how many million Jewish people, Jewish workers into the sea. We've got to find a solution that suits them both and realize that it's capitalism that's causing all the problems. And the, the, the thing is to me, We've got to, I mean, it comes back to this whole question we've discussed before, the need for a workers' party, because that's what's really lacking in this situation. I know it's long term, but I can't see any short term getting together and having another battle in five years' time or three years' time. It's just going to be a continual grind, and that's what you've got there. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. All right, thanks, Dominic. So we'll take Finn and then yeah. Kieran, and we'll finish with Roger, who will also tell us about next week's meeting. So go ahead, Finn. I think that's a very important point, which I completely agree with, which Dominic has raised there, about the need to unite as workers and to take an independent position as workers. And the only resolution of this problem in Israel and the West Bank is a socialist uh, solution. There is no intermediate solution. It has to be socialist. I recently... I had a visit uh, to Palestine and Israel with a trade union group, and we met with um, a lot of organizations, uh, Jewish organizations and uh, Palestinian organizations. And there are uh, civil rights organizations which are Jewish and which assist the Palestine, Palestinians in, in their case. Many has done us a favor in raising the horrific horror story that's happening now. But we need, uh, as Dominic has alluded to, we don't need to decide between Hamas and the Israeli government. That's not the choice we have to make. And we have to be careful not to be swept into that. I mean, H Hamas won an election in Gaza. That doesn't confer on Hamas the right to do as they wish. And in the West Bank, the PLO is now a corrupt uh, organization which has no support amongst the Palestinians. So the failure of the... There's no leadership being provided for the Palestinian people other than what's emerging from Hamas and the PLO, both of which will not solve a single problem which the Palestinian workers are currently facing. It's essential we have a full discussion of this matter on a win, at one of our win meetings, because the kind of references that will come up briefly in a meeting of this nature can often be misinterpreted and maybe be a, a bit imbalanced. I mean, we're all familiar with the Nakba and the destruction of Palestinian villages and the evictions and the rest of it, which happened. And as I said, we saw it ourselves when we were in Israel. The, we met a settlement group as well. Uh, there's some roads which can't be used by uh, Palestinian people. They're reserved for Israeli citizens. Uh, all that is a fact, but that doesn't take us any closer to finding a resolution of the problem. But one thing we had to avoid is being forced into making a decision, do we support Hamas or do we support the Israeli government? That is not the choice. The only resolution, is, as Dominic has suggested, is to create a common organization of workers, which encompasses both the Arabs, Palestinians, and uh, the Israeli uh, population. There's a lot of provocation going on as well. When the uh, Israeli government speak about the West Bank, they talk about Judea and Samaria because they don't accept for their own propaganda purposes that the Palestinians form a people. We can't get swept along with that. On the other hand, also you have some Hamas um, people saying Israel shouldn't exist, which is equally destructive and damaging to the cause for socialism. So we don't take sides. We take an independent workers' position and then analyse critically the actions 
of the Israeli government, and we know about the horrors that they have inflicted on the Palestinians. We know about the evictions, the water being taken from them, the farms being destroyed, workers not having access to their own job. We know about that, and we know that the Hamas are calling for the destruction and the wipeout of Israel, which is equally reprehensible. So I just finished with the point I began with. We must take an independent position. We don't have to decide between Hamas and Israeli government. And our approach is to create a socialist system, socialist federation, if that's what emerges across the Middle East. It's, it's not just about Palestine and Israel, by the way. It also includes Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, and many, many countries across the region. This call for a, a socialist resolution to the problems of the Middle East. But as I say, we have to have a fuller discussion. We won't resolve any of these questions just now. No, no, we won't. No. Okay, thanks, Finn. Um, finally, Kieran. Are you still here, Kieran? Yes, Pam. Hiya, uh, right. Yes, very briefly, I assume, like all the comrades, that we will have a full discussion in the next short period, as we should. Events yesterday took the world by surprise, and I think took us by surprise. But I think we all expected an escalation of violence somewhere. I expected it, I think most comrades did in the West Bank. But there were also indications, and still are, that Hezbollah perhaps might launch an offensive across the Lebanese border. That was possible. But we had to stand back, as the comrades have all said, uh, and think this through from the point of view, perspective of Marxism, and arrive at an independent position. And we, and we are in a powerful place in the sense of our ideas. You know, we, we have to emphasize that internally and then produce material that answers the questions. But one week ago, maybe two weeks ago, I was listening to the, the London news, the United Kingdom news on a Sunday. Uh, it's short news. And in that news, that short item, there were five news reports which all reflected the intractability of national conflicts under capitalism. There was a brief mention of events in Israel-Palestine. There was a mention of the exodus from the Gorno karabakh where the Armenian population had fled the enclave. There was a mention of the right-wing parties in Spain opposing the, the possibility of some of the Catalonian parties coming into government with PSOE. And if that were to happen, then there would be an amnesty for the the Catalan leaders who organized the illegal referendum. There was a mention of the American state uh, uh, seeking to, uh, demanding that the Serbian forces pull back from Kosovo. And there was a mention of the imposition of the Irish Sea border, the customs border, which was imposed in across Irish Sea border two weeks ago and which has increased tensions in Northern Ireland. And we know in all five cases, to most working people, most young people, they just appear to be intractable. Or the only solution ultimately is an agorno karabakh solution where one side wins, imposes its will, and the other pop and the population flees. And we know that more is possible than this. We also know that the next one, two, three weeks will bring bloodshed on a huge scale. Israel almost certainly will invade Gaza. And almost certainly, again, Hamas have prepared for this for many years uh, and will have built their defences and the Israeli state forces will suffer heavy casualties. But the ordinary people of Gaza will suffer 10 times more casualties. We, we support the right of any oppressed people, including the Palestinian people, to, to uh, defend themselves. Uh, but we do argue that the tactics of Hamas in crossing the border and the approach they have taken is not in the interest of the Palestinian people. It will, it will lead to defeat and devastation uh, and has driven what what opposition figures existed because the opposition in Israel is very weak, but what opposition figures did exist have now joined a national unity government within hours of the attacks. So we support the right to self-defense. Uh, we support the right to strike back, uh, but we have to argue that the, the tactics are incorrect. And of course, we give no, no support to the Hamas government. So there's nothing more we can say today. We will all watch events unfold. And I, I, I wonder if Roger's about to propose that the, the next meeting, maybe our meeting very soon, is on this very question. Because obviously it's a live question. There will be demonstrations. I note in London yesterday there were demonstrations, spontaneous demonstrations, uh, in, in certain communities who are in favour or support the Palestinian people or, and support Hamas. So it, it'll be a live issue across the globe that we have to pay careful attention to. 
Okay, thanks very much, Kieran. I was going to bring Roger in next, but Trish has popped a hand up. If, I think we've got time. If you could be very brief, Trish, and then I'll bring Roger in. Yeah, I'm not sure my opinion. Thanks for letting me come in, Pam. I'm not sure my opinion is necessarily going to be met um, with with the same. I'm, I'm getting a sense that everybody's trying to be extremely diplomatic here about being independent and not picking sides and all of that. Essentially, we're talking about a group of people who've been trounced upon by America, really, using using Israel, you know, the, the whole world is trouncing on Palestinians one way or another. And actually, I am picking a side. And um, I'm, I, this is not a border. We shouldn't be spouting the propaganda we're hearing on the BBC. It's offence. It's offence in one country. And it's offence where the 70% of the people living in Gaza are refugees from the other area. They've been pushed into an open prison in their own country. I really don't feel comfortable sitting here how we all need to be independent and Hamas are, are making atrocious decisions. Hamas are fighting dirty, a bit like the IRA have had to. When you're oppressed by an enormous imperialist body like Britain, like England, or indeed like America in the Middle East, and, and um, the Zionist movement. You fight dirty, you fight the only way you can to protect your family. There's no border in Gaza, there's a fence. And they broke through a fence in their own country. I know my side and it's definitely not with the um, Israel. Okay, thanks Trish. This just shows why we do need a longer discussion uh, very, very soon. <laughs> so we can go into all these sorts of arguments. Right, so finally, Roger. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, um... Kieran anticipated what I was going to say. He's read my mind. But obviously, uh, we should do our best to try to organise a meeting on this next week. We, the, the, uh, the topic that we had planned was um, already a little belated, but the uh, 50th anniversary of the coup in Chile and the lessons. And that is very, very rich in lessons, particularly when you look at the, um, the, uh, you know, the illusions that there were under the Corbyn period and uh, of other left groups in Europe, uh, of what it would take to carry through to carry through a transformation of society. So we will discuss that too. But I do think, obviously, this uh, situation in in um, Israel Palestine is one that we should be uh, giving priority to at this time. I don't want. I mean, I I want to resist the temptation to make some points of my own, but I would just put it this way that. Um, of course, Trish, we uh, we solidarise ourselves with the people of um, of Hamas, uh, people of uh, Gaza, who are being suffering the most intense and uh, appalling uh, oppression and brutality. I mean, they they're, they're brocaded in a permanent state of siege. Comrades have already referred to the fact of that that they that they don't have access to. To uh, basic facilities, even to to um, to more than uh, more than uh, survival uh, uh, rations, if you like, if even that, they're blockaded in a state of siege. When they try to stage a protest at the fence, they're mercilessly chopped down. And in their desperation, it's understandable that they would support uh, any kind of um, gesture of uh, defiance. But it is all the same. We have to say it's a kamikaze type fight back. And therefore, the best service we can do, the best solidarity we can show is not just to say, yes, of course, we're with you emotionally. But what would be the best way? What is the way? And it's not an easy um, uh, thing to answer. But what is the way forward? How can actually there be an improvement or a change in the appalling um, conditions there? And I'm afraid that Hamas will lead them to a catastrophe. And so it's really, it is our task to try to build the forces of uh, Marxism, of socialism, of internationalism. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, of course, our main enemy is not the Israeli people, but the Israeli state and US imperialism, which is um, exploiting and abusing uh, the the population of Israel to use them in their own, uh, in their own, fiendish uh, interests, if you like. But I, I will, you know, assure the comrades that we'll do our best to find a, a way to give this a proper um, uh, airing at the next um, meeting next week. Okay? 
Okay, thanks, Roger. Right, so that's the end of the meeting then. <laughs> um, Roger, Roger will send a notification out during the week, hopefully, uh, if we, we manage to find somebody suitable to speak. So, um, otherwise, that's the end of the meeting. Thanks, everyone, for speaking. Thanks again, Zizis, for his wonderful lead-off, and hopefully we'll see you next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Bye for now.